Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay back there in the back? Yes. Okay. <laughs> My name is Heather Wolfter. I am the Dean of the School of Architecture, and I would like to extend such a warm welcome to everyone who's had the privilege of, of coming here today to tonight's event. Um, it really is an exciting moment, and I'm, I'm so pleased that we're back in school and that we're kicking off the semester with such a fantastic lecture and exhibition opening. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Paul Lewis of LTL, Lewis Trumaki Lewis Architects, which are based in New York. Following his lecture, we will also host an opening for a complimentary exhibition entitled Biogenic House Sections. Paul joins us from New York practicing and also as a professor at Princeton University, where he taught since 2000. He received his Bachelor of Arts from Wesleyan University and his Master of Architecture from Princeton. With an active practice and a significant teaching appointment, he was impressively also past president of the Architectural League of New York and a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. LTL's built work includes an art center in Austin, if you want to check it out, the contemporary Austin, Upson Hall at Cornell University, Steeplechase Pier at Coney Island, the Helen Walton Children's Enrichment Center, um, in Bentonville, Arkansas, which isn't very far away, also worth a visit, <laughs> and projects at Vassar College, uh, New York University, and Columbia University. They are also recent winners of an invited design competition for an art center in Colorado, um, a project called Poster House, a museum dedicated to posters located in New York City. The firm's design and drawings have been exhibited worldwide, including the U.S. Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. And their work is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and Carnegie Museum of Art. In addition to their built works and exhibition, LTL Architects are the authors of several publications including Intensities in 2013, Opportunistic Architecture 2008, and Situation Normal in Pamphlet Architecture in 1998. Their most recent publication focuses on the sustainable material assemblies of the contemporary house section, which is a sequel to the 2016 book, Manual of Section, which was an influential piece found on most studio desks nearly a decade ago. Building on the work and drawings from this earlier publication, the Manual of Biogenic House Sections is another catalytic moment, promising to reinforce a critical shift in our conception of buildings produced by living materials. The Deutsch Architecture Museum selected this newest book as one of the 10 best architecture books of the year. Our own faculty member, Alexandra Yeshka, viewed this work at Princeton University in the exhibition uh, format. With parallel interests, she urgently saw the importance of bringing this work to UT Austin. In her words, biogenic materials tend to be either ignored or treated as alternative construction techniques that have no place in mainstream architectural discourse. Their book, helps change this situation by analyzing dozens of built projects meaningful for environmental terms, reducing carbon emissions, examining toxicity, etc., while also creating beautiful and architecturally significant works in and of themselves. In the book and exhibition, LTL showcases spatially and formally innovative projects while challenging traditional values that characterize most of the contemporary residential construction in the United States. While this material lies out an argument for using regenerative materials, the scope of significance rapidly elevates beyond the built environment as we consider the disastrous effects of the climate crisis and lack of ecological equity worldwide. The beauty in the drawings and the degree of experimentation in the works also point to an egalitarian society with access to healthy environments 
and good design. From their book, quote, building with biogenic materials does not need to come at the expense of architectural imagination and experimentation, but quite the reverse. It should sponsor new spatial, formal, and experiential possibilities. Please join us for the following uh, exhibition opening, and I wanted just to remind you of that, um, in Me Bain Gallery. Um, and again, can we welcome Paul Lewis, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, is the uh, mic on? Is it, can everyone hear me at this point? So, all right, good, good, good. So, Thank you for very kind and kind of wonderfully um, clear introduction. Um, it's fantastic to have that kind of setup. So now I don't have to present as exhaustively. It's kind of you kind of know a lot of the arguments. Great, um, but it's it's a real thrill to be here, and uh, uh, I'm going to get right in on it. Um, so we we produced this book uh, as was mentioned uh, in 2016, and um, one of the arguments behind the manual se uh, of section was trying to think about ways that we could develop a kind of typology of section. In a sense, looking at how section was a way of resisting some of the excesses of capitalism, which demands you do as much efficiently as possible, and how architects could use section to, in a sense, produce greater innovation, spatial possibilities, etc. cetera. Um, and the, the book has done very well. It's been translated, I think, into seven languages. We've been told there's a Turkish edition. We've not seen a copy. If you have a copy, please send me an image. Um, but it's it, it was it was you know very pleased by this book. But in some respects, the more recent book that we've uh, we we've done, the Manual of Biogenic House Sections, we actually think is a more important one. Um, it makes a an argument that really does transform the very kind of nature of what we do as architects. Um, it makes an argument that we think is optimistic about what what is possible uh, in an era defined largely by crisis, whether it's the climate crisis, equity crisis, etc but lays out that there are positive steps. There's ways that we can kind of move forward. And more importantly, there's a really interesting moment for kind of completely rethinking basic assumptions we've inherited from modernism about the nature of materials, about how we build, where we place value, and finding ways to kind of conjoin issues of, inv of invention with issues of concern, um, to look at how invention and uh, attending to the crises can be done simultaneously. Um, um, and, a, and a lot of this is done through the specific uh, ins, uh, inspection of the agency of materials, um, which has always been something that we've been interested in the practice, but now shifting the very nature of what those materials are. So the book is based on nine chapters that I'll go through, uh, looking at various uh, bio and geogenic materials. Um, but the 10th chapter is equally important, which is reuse. And very quickly, uh, reuse has been instrumental in our practice for many years. Uh, I think the cliche that you all know is that the, 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 uh, the, the most green building is the one that already exists. Um, you know, reuse is itself a very interesting way to kind of in invent different approaches to architecture where the found building is, in a sense, a kind of constraint that engenders a very different way to think about the project uh, that you build anew and to start to think about architecture as something that evolves over time. So the project we did uh, 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 about gosh, 10 years ago, I've been maybe longer than that, um, in, uh, in, in downtown Austin, uh, originally a renovation to uh, uh, transform a theater building that uh, from the 1920s, that then in the 1950s became a department store, and then uh, we, uh, was turned into a contemporary arts center, and trying to think st uh, strategically about how we would deploy changes and adjustments that saw the history of the building, the trajectory of the building being the important aspect. And then we got the opportunity to kind of rethink this building, doing the rooftop, the Jim Hodges sign. Um, so uh, even within this very central building downtown, it's the, it's the evolution of the history of the building. And it's going to change again. Now even the wall is used as a mural. It's fantastic. The more buildings change and adjust, the better. So um, other reuse projects we've done, this used to be a maintenance building on, uh, on Claremont's campus. Uh, but it ended up being this fantastic space once you clear it out that could allow for a very unusual uh, office, an open office space for about 100 employees. Um, 
And a recent project we did in, in New York, Poster House, was this strange through block building, a kind of an unusual case where you could actually walk through the building and pass from 23rd Street to 24th Street. And that became the heart of the project, right? So how could we both make a kind of um, thermally conditioned, humidity controlled gallery space that would in a sense be nested within this existing space? Um, we became very interested in how we could make a building within a building um, and how the geometry of that new building, a series of lines that would uh, coalesce at the front door into the gallery. Um, and a lot of the specifics of this project were played out through materials. So all of the new materials that you kind of see on the right, the strange split screen was intentional. Um, we would get the, the kind of new materials, in this case, a kind of clay-based clay plaster uh, that formed the kind of new gallery space that then would uh, be an interesting contrast to the existing, uh, the existing uh, shell. We also looked at the de designing this lengthy 220 foot long uh, wood, uh, wood millwork. Um, I should say that the entire space slopes about three feet from 23rd Street to 24th. Mill workers don't like working with that kind of variation, so it was a bit of a nightmare to do that project. Um, but we ended up with a gallery space, and we're very pleased with uh, ways that we could get this kind of friction between old and new, even putting the capital of the, uh, the cast iron capitals on display while also kind of, uh, uh, kind of hiding them a little bit within the thickness uh, of this new construction. But a lot of our reuse work um, has focused on operational carbon. So we've been very concerned with thicknesses, insulation, uh, the insulation of the building, the performance of the building relative to questions of energy. So with the project at Cornell, it was all about putting a new skin on a science building that had been built in the 60s and thinking about those thicknesses, thinking about how the sun would be better engaged. And that was really the kind of driving thought behind a, a number of the kind of materializations of these renovation projects. In the last four years, we've really changed how we've, uh, we're, we're thinking about uh, uh, how materials can be a catalyst, in specific thinking about the, the role of embodied carbon. Um, and in a sense, by really thinking about uh, materials that go beyond simply their aesthetics, but also about um, their, uh, their inherent nature, the energy, things that you don't necessarily see within the material that starts to change the very parameters of value uh, that we bring to the, uh, to the projects themselves. So what I'll present today is really a kind of, um, a kind of interlocking between two different um, uh, kind of research projects. One is the manual um, of biogenic house sections, and then the other are a series of houses that we've designed subsequent to the manual that have looked at ways that um, materials could be a catalyst for a different model uh, of architectural organization and form. But I need to do a little bit of a kind of, you know, setting the stage about, well, why, why would we even do this? Um, and I apologize for those of you um, who feel as though I'm preaching to the choir. I apologize for that. Um, but it is worth kind of putting this in context. Um, we know that global, um, global carbon emissions are, uh, uh, are way too high relative to climate um, and that we're leading towards catastrophic consequences. This means, and these are arguments that have been made by other organizations, Carbon Leadership Forum, Architecture 2030, et cetera, um, but it means that we have to have a kind of radical shift in the way in which um, we approach questions of, uh, of carbon emissions and need to have a 65% reduction of carbon by 2030 30 to get to net zero by 2050 to avoid the most extreme problems of, uh, of climate. This is, this is known. The, the tricky thing is, and this is where it kind of hits home for architects, is that about roughly 39% of uh, global carbon emissions can be attributed to uh, the building, uh, building sector. Again, a well-known statistic, probably been repeated ad nauseum. But what's interesting there is that of, those, uh, of that 39%, most of it is operational carbon. But increasingly, um, more and more of it is actually attributed to the embodied carbon, the carbon needed to make the materials for the building uh, to begin with. This becomes even more difficult when you take a new building, um, which is to say that operational carbon is all the buildings that, um, that already exist and their energy used to, uh, to make them inhabitable. The embodied carbon is being released now on an annual basis. So if you were to take new construction between now and uh, 2050, about half of the carbon attributed to those buildings is from the materials themselves. Um, and this becomes even worse if you look at high performance buildings. Ironically, the better they perform in terms of operation, 
the more the percentage of carbon is attributed to their materials. So you're looking at, you know, say 56% in a high performing building. The other thing is that carbon that goes into the materials comes up front. And so it takes time for the, um, the operational carbon to catch up. So if we're concerned about carbon that's released now, the major pressure has to be on rethinking the embodied carbon in materials themselves. It's a huge factor. And it also gives us a kind of, in a sense, greater agency as designers, where operational carbon tends to shift a lot of emphasis towards mechanical engineers and to kind of questions of the thermal performance and the operation of the building. The world of, uh, of embodied carbon is inherently within what we specify. It's what we design with. It's what we put together to make the building, which is why it makes it so kind of exciting, a, a great a kind of fantastic opportunity to kind of rethink what we do in the world of architecture. Now, one other argument that is made is that we should just reuse our way into the future. We shouldn't build any new buildings. And there's a, a, a number of people who make that argument. I'm all for reuse, but it's not going to deal with the incredible demand that we're going to have globally for new construction. Um, so we're looking at demand of about 2.5 trillion square feet between now and 2060. And how do we deal with this uh, means that we have to kind of think about reinventing the very materials we use. Now, what this means, though, is not just kind of substituting different materials in existing paradigms of architecture, but it really does argue for a fundamentally different paradigm of how we go about considering uh, the very uh, nature or the logic of, of the buildings. Um, so not just moving away from uh, the carbon intensive uh, materials of modernism, concrete, uh, steel, and glass in particular, but also shifting from a kind of linear uh, kind of extraction process of ex uh, pulling the materials out, m uh, heavy intensive uh, energy to make the materials and then ultimately ending up in the, in the landfill, but thinking about architecture as a kind of part of a kind of regenerative uh, process where the act of, uh, of, uh, of producing the materials um, the act of inhabiting buildings, the act of kind of the end of life of buildings, all of these things start to be worked in much more of a circular fashion. So we're not seeing a kind of linear extraction uh, as being a, a simply a kind of process that ends in the landfill, but we see the role of the architect as part of a much more complex system. Our role as architects is to move beyond specifying materials as consumers and really thinking about how we can be part of larger processes Take, expanding the territory of what we consider uh, uh, areas that we need to be concerned with. Where do the materials come from? How are they manufactured? Where do they end up at the end of their life? And how can we design to build in uh, kind of circular economies? Now, we know that materials are not all equal, and this is just a kind of chart from uh, existing databases of carbon, uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, footprints, if you will, of different materials. And of course, the materials on the top with the highest carbon footprint to the right are your steel, your concrete, your glass, et cetera. And not surprisingly, the ones that are sequestering, if you include the biogenic carbon, are the ones that are coming from plants, right? So woods, et cetera. And that's really where we focus the energy within the book. Um, how do, we how do we look at how these materials have been uh, used in different projects around the world? One of the things that we were a little bit critical of is um, architecture exploration, explorations that end in pavilions. We really want things to actually be tested out in, in, in buildings that have to deal with all of the kind of problems um, uh, of weather, of code, of constructability, et cetera. So the, 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 the purpose of the book was to to make legible existing built houses from around the world that use these materials to produce architectural invention. Um, one of the criticisms we get is, well, why'd you do houses? Aren't houses part of the problem? And absolutely true, which is to say, the house, the single family house, is, tends to consume a lot of carbon. It uses a lot of real estate, et cetera. Um, but for us, the house was a type that we could get examples of um, that showed different materials being used. In other words, the house continues to be a site of experimentation. It's, it's been that um, uh, for a number of years, a number of uh, centuries, really. And so the house was a kind of great format to look at uh, 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 kind of examples of built projects. The other thing is, in terms of the book, the house, in terms of drawings, were something that would allow us, in a single page, to show the materials within the section. Um, and in the manual section, there's some very large-scale buildings where you can't 
tell what's in the wall. With a house, you can usually see what's in the, in the wall within the, within the drawing. And the other thing is that the, the houses are not going away. They're gonna continue to be great demand for houses. And our interest was, are there models of houses, and they, are there models of houses that look more innov uh, uh, innovatively towards uh, questions of materials, and more importantly, do it at a relatively small scale? So most of the houses within the book, and again, there are 55 houses drawn from around the world, relatively, uh, most of them are, are not iconic houses. Um, and we, and most of them are less than 1,000 square feet. So the book starts with, a, in a sense, a kind of critique, if you will, of the single family house in the, in the US in particular. Um, and not the least of which is that we've gone from a condition where the average house in, say, 1950 was about 1,000 square feet, and now it's ballooned up to about 2,500 square feet. So the, the house has gotten too big, and the reason why it's been able to get so big is that the materials used in the houses are increasingly um, inexpensive. Cheap would be the other word, but they're, they're inexpensive. Um, and they often tend to be uh, quite, uh, um, quite toxic, to be blunt, um, uh, coming from petrochemical sources. Um, and I won't go through this whole history, but one of the key things for the book for us was to align both the, the knowledge that plant-based materials not only have lower carbon, but um, much healthier kind of lives, uh, much more uh, healthy um, kind of quality in terms of the air, and also in terms of their sites of extraction and their, as I mentioned before, their end of life use. Um, so we are trying to find a way that we don't see the landfill as simply the, the, the end result of architecture, but to see um, buildings having a kind of greater, uh, greater uh, existence, uh, both upstream and downstream through the materials. The other thing that um, uh, most, most, uh, most of us know is that if you look closely at the wall section, you're looking at this incredibly bizarre um, coagulation of different materials. That in that thin wall section, and architects tend to only too often only obsess about the exterior finish and the interior finish, but that wall section is made up of all kinds of different materials. Most of them are lightweight, they're thin, they're what we call single performing, they only do one thing often. Um, they often argue for their hygienic quality and they produce this strict binary between interior and exterior. Um, and so this is something we want to kind of critique within the book. We were really interested in projects that might only use say one material, that might embrace thickness, that might be able to do with that one material what all those other multiple materials uh, have to do independently. Um, and in the process actually do it better because one of the downsides of that sandwich of materials is that one material might actually cause a problem for the other one that the manufacturer of that one material is kind of wants you to not know about, right? So you get these um, contradictory uh, effects. If you ask anybody who put vinyl wall covering on the inside of a house in a high humid uh, climate, uh, and their mold that develops on the backside of that vinyl, that's a good example of, of that unintended consequences. Um, but the house, uh, the book is, is based on these uh, often thick houses, looking at these material assemblies, how we can kind of reduce the quantity of material and increase the quality uh, of the way in which those materials perform. So I want to go through, the, um, through the, the, some of these chapters and argue for um, uh, the differences between some of these major materials. Um, each of the chapters in the book are um, kind of present the material, uh, present their standard kind of, not standard, but their current uh, kind of approximate calculation based on published databases, carbon databases. Um, we, with each chapter, we look at the kind of ways that the material exists within the life cycle of construction and end of life, um, how we can kind of look at this uh, through a kind of circular lens, but also look at how we go from a plant, uh, in this case trees, to a product, and what are the steps that, uh, the kind of standard steps that one uh, needs to look at, so we as architects can start to embrace a slightly larger perspective on how we think about materials. We're not just specifying product, but we need to be conscious of these larger consequences, and it also gives greater agency and uh, ability to be involved in the process. Um, for each of the projects, we include a kind of exploded axonometric. 
We also included construction photographs uh, of the house, uh, as well as interior and exterior views. Um, unlike, the, as I said, the manual section, these aren't uh, well-known buildings often, and so we wanted to make sure that the interior effects and the exterior effects are visible, along with the kind of cross-sectional perspective that we spent a very long time uh, drawing uh, to try to get that uh, coordination between the analytical cut of the section and then the kind of inhabited perspective uh, of, of being in the, in the project. Um, we, to do the book, we, I think we went, through, we, we went through looking at probably 300 different houses. Um, we were trying to find a way that we were always picking houses that had an architectural ambition, that were not simply kind of using the materials, but using the materials in a banal way. And I will admit that doing that process during the pandemic, we became very um, interested in generating our own designs. So we did uh, produce uh, five houses based on uh, plant-based materials and looking at how those could be kind of a, a source for invention. So I'll weave these two together. Um, the, the, uh, the chapters of the book and then also the speculative houses we've designed. The speculative houses we've designed tend to use a range of different materials and how those got, uh, get brought together um, uh, productively. Um, all right. So mass timber. Um, mass timber has kind of become the poster child for plant-based materials. Um, it is not going to save us. Uh, I think that's probably a fair way to put it, even though I think with a lot of students, it used to be that you look at their rhino model and ask them, eh, what is that made out of? And they said, uh, concrete. Um, that was the previous default mode. Now, if you ask what their rhino model is made out of, the argument is often uh, CLT. Um, so this is, you know, I, it's, it's a bit of a problem. Um, the basic issue with mass timber is that um, is that the carbon that's released through the process of harvesting wood and the kind of carbon release from the soils, it's very, it's, 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 there's questions as to whether it's actually a net benefit. And I won't go into all the, the details, but uh, all of this to say that it takes, you know, 30 to 100 years to grow a tree. Um, and even with FSC or Forest Stewardship Council uh, managed forest, the carbon loss is often um, greater than the carbon that might be stored within, uh, within, the, within the, the mass timber. Um, I mean, to put it another way, if a, typically a tree, only about 50% of the tree is used to make the lumber, you've got 50% that's already being released, so it's a, it's a wash to begin with. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult to argue that mass timber is going to be the single solution, despite the fact that as a product class, uh, as a product class, it's much more advanced than any of the other plant-based materials I'll be presenting. Um, but it shouldn't be seen as the sole solution. Um, there's also problems with glues and, ad, um, and other adhesives that are necessary to make the mass timber. Uh, there are soy-based and other bio-based ad, uh, adhesives that are coming out. Certainly dowel-laminated dowel um, timber that doesn't use the adhesives, et cetera. Um, but one of the other criticisms we have about mass timber is it tends to just be used to replace the logic of, say, concrete or steel. Uh, it gets used in post and beam construction, used as uh, plates. And I think that's fine in terms of its, its uh, acceptance within the market. But it doesn't really kind of test the possibilities of mass timber that are um, unique to the, the nature of making these very long pieces of sheet good. Um, the exceptions, uh, we, we selected projects in the book that we thought were exceptions to that rule. So Jennifer Bonner's House Gables is this kind of fantastic house that would only be possible through the tectonic uh, and the material uh, qualities of, uh, of the, the kind of structural uh, sheet good, uh, this very large uh, sheet good of, of, uh, of mass timber, uh, a kind of fantastic house. Um, that is really a kind of showcase for the possibilities uh, of CLT. Or uh, Atelier Sotoma's uh, meteorite, this enigmatic figure, that if you look closely is incredibly strange, which is to say that it is two layers of mass timber, one nested inside of each other, and the space between is a kind of an insulative cavity that's almost at the scale of the house itself. Um, so you have a building that really is just two layers of, uh, of mass timber, or CLT, uh, there's a stain, paste on, uh, uh, a stain placed on the outside, and that's it, right? Um, so it's kind of an extraordinary project. It sequesters about uh, 48,000 uh, kilograms of CO2, um, and again, is, is specific to the unique characteristics of mass timber. So 
We kind of went the other way with a house we designed called uh, the CLTA frame. And our interest here was to not take the blank, the 10 foot by 50 foot, and cut it up in all kinds of little fragments, but to actually use the blank in its very, very large scale um, to, to produce a different model of an A-frame house. So in a sense, this house is really five pairs of these 10 foot by 50 foot blanks that are placed parallel to each other. Uh, the ones at the back are, are kind of stabilized by a staircase that works up the height of the building. And as you work your way to the front of the house, these things incline closer to each other until at the front of the house, they form the extremely high peak of a very, very tall, elongated uh, A-frame house. It means that you have this kind of stair that can work its way up to the top of the building. And at the top of the house, you get this roof deck uh, that allows you to kind of exist up in the, uh, up in the tops uh, of the trees. And of course, one of the great things about um, uh, mass timber and CLT in particular is that you don't have to apply the interior finishes. The wood can be the interior. And so here we get an interior that's a product of the, uh, of the CLT itself. All right, so bamboo. Um, so while CLT is limited by the kind of um, the slow growth of forest, bamboo is one of the fastest growing plants um, uh, around, and it has compressive and tensile strengths that exceed wood and start to have some uh, competitive nature with steel and concrete. It's a fantastic material. Its growth is prolific. Uh, you can usually kind of get, um, you can start to harvest bamboo at three to five years. Uh, it has a higher sequestration rate of carbon than wood does. Um, and it's often um, uh, harvested not by clear cutting as one would likely do in a, uh, uh, for wood, uh, but it's done by kind of selectively removing individual columns. The downside to bamboo is that the adhesives and the, the kind of curing agents right now are actually quite toxic and fairly carbon intensive, that there needs to be greater work done on that. But the laminating of bamboo in lumber um, has definitely had some uh, negative consequences that need to be worked on. On the other hand, one can work with the columns themselves. Now, this presents the problem that they're not standardized, right? Um, that each column is slightly different. Um, but there's been uh, examples of houses that have used bundles of these columns to produce very, very unusual uh, architectural uh, kind of spaces and forms. We really love this house in, uh, in Ecuador that really uses the cross bracing, if you will, of the bamboo columns to form a continuous ramp up through the middle of the house. It's kind of Villa Savoie, except spread out over the entirety of the house um, and, and integral to the very structural uh, assembly uh, of the building. Or in Anna Herringer's uh, kind of uh, hostel project, uh, youth hostel project, I should say, uh, here the bamboo is used to make a kind of incredible diaphanous screen, a kind of uh, initial protection against the weather on which you have a kind of rammed earth interior uh, from which the sleeping, uh, sleeping beds cantilever off. And again, this is only possible by the flexibility and the unique nature uh, of relatively small scale bamboo really almost woven into uh, a building that's at the scale. Uh, it's really a basket at the scale of a building. All right, so earth. Um, it lacks, the, uh, it lacks the, uh, the ability to deal with tension in the same way in which wooden bamboo does, but it has the capacity to work uh, under compression quite well, right? Um, it can be a load-bearing structure. It's one of the oldest building materials. Um, it's ubiquitous. It's, exp it's inexpensive. Um, it's inherently local. Um, and as long as you're using clay as a binder, it has very, very low carbon um, uh, emissions associated with it. Um, unfortunately, a lot of rammed earth is, uses a fairly high level of Portland cement, um, and so that, which decreases uh, its, its value uh, ecologically. Um, so the, the goal needs to be using rammed earth, working with clays, and also trying to make sure that you then deal with questions of erosion uh, as part of the overall design. The other thing is because it goes from a liquid to a solid, it can be 3D printed um, and doesn't involve the 3D printing uh, of concrete, uh, or I should say it doesn't have the carbon uh, footprint that one has with the 3D printing of concrete, which is much more common. Um, so with the, the Vaughn House Flurry project, one of the things we loved about this project is that um, 
you have the moment here where the walls are actually being uh, shaped with, with a spade. So the finished wall is actually uh, a product of stacking up an excess of, uh, of straw and earth. It's a kind of cob system. And then basically shearing that off to produce these walls. And you get this really fantastic contrast between the kind of dense texture of the earthen wall and then the light of the wood of the floor and the ceiling. And the floor and the ceiling in this project are infilled with straw to produce the insulation. And it's worth noting that uh, the roofs actually cantilever beyond the limits of the, the wall to protect, again, against, uh, against water erosion, which is the biggest problem uh, with rammed earth. Um, but it's you know, kind of fantastic to think that the entirety of the wall is basically a kind of monolith, right? It's insulation, it's structure, it's finish. Um, this particular wall is augmented with internal wood, a uh, small amount of wood that does help stabilize the roof. Um, but it's this kind of very fundamentally non-modern <laughs> uh, approach to building, and yet um, super, super interesting. Um, of course, uh, earth can be used in blocks, earth blocks. So this is a project that involves 15,000 4 by 8 by 16 blocks uh, by Carre Architecture in Burkina Faso and West Africa. Um, both producing the walls, but also the vaulting that spans across these walls. And it's worth noting with this project that the erosion um, or the protection against erosion was uh, played, uh, played out with a very small or limited use of steel trusses and corrugated metal. Um, we're a big believer in not making uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good. So in this case, the, you know, the selective use of metal that makes everything else work is, is, is super critical. It also means that the water is essentially being harvested by the building and connects to the, the kind of uh, larger cisterns that, um, that use the rooftop as a kind of water collection device. Um, so in terms of 3D printing, there's some really interesting examples, and this is emerging in a number of different places. The ability to use 3D printing and Earth. This is a, um, a company uh, outside of Bologna, Wasp, that has 3D printed uh, half-inch layers over about 200 hours to make a kind of prototypical, uh, uh, prototypical house. And what's, what's possible here is that, unlike the mass wall um, that you had with the Von House Flurry project, here it's a very intricate kind of weaving of cells. And and then the cavity spaces are then filled uh, with rice husks to produce the insulation. So the building produces its structure, its skin, but also leaves space for other forms of insulation uh, within the project. So with a project called Lamella Earth House, we are interested in kind of combining both the role of bamboo and thatch uh, with, with the mass of earth and to try to uh, place one building inside the other. Um, so the larger outer shell of this project, and I should say that this was a project for a kind of new model of a, of a kind of farmhouse uh, in the Northeast. Um, we looked at ways that one could work with just um, a single size or a single joint. Uh, so one single piece of bamboo eight feet long and one single joint, and that through a kind of lamella system, develop an entire uh, lattice that would um, produce the, the, the space. On the north side, we'd clad this with a density of, uh, of thatch. And on the south side was a plant-based polycarbonate that would effectively make the space, um, the larger space, a kind of a greenhouse. So using it to heat up the space um, so that in cold weather, the delta between the, uh, the, the, the amount of temperature you need or heat needed to keep this as, at a normal temperature, a comfortable temperature, would be less because this would already be thermally conditioned based on this nested sequence. Um, we also like the idea that the rammed earth project was kind of embedded in the ground into the, into the field, if you will, um, and the idea that the roofscape would be an active uh, place within, uh, within the working uh, space of the greenhouse. So it was, a, it was trying to find a way that the, you know, some of the lessons from the manual section, the idea of a kind of nested section would be combined with different material approaches relative to gradients of thermal comfort. Um, and ultimately producing a, a different model uh, of the farmhouse, the barn uh, uh, in, in the Northeast. So the, uh, the last three, pro uh, three materials that I'll present are all insulation. And I think it's fair to say that we, prior to about four years ago, were not that obsessed with insulation. Um, as long as we achieved an R value, that was probably fine. But we didn't kind of become, you know, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time 
you know, meticulously caring about insulation. But one of the interesting aspects of, uh, of the current state of insulation is that they're actually uh, a, a kind of large source of the, the, uh, the carbon emissions within a building. Uh, after the structure, after the foundations, um, one of uh, the insulation becomes a kind of key factor. So um, we, we started to kind of look very closely at what are the roles um, uh, that these plant-based materials might have in insulation. And hemp is a fantastic um, insulator. It's also a fantastic plant. Um, and it has the capacity to be compressed into uh, different models of lumber. But as I said, it's mostly used, uh, primarily now used for uh, a kind of insulation. Um, it grows like bamboo quite quickly, about a foot per week, uh, reaching maturity in about three months. So it is possible to do two growing cycles of hemp uh, in the uh, course of a given year. It has a long root system, uh, can be regenerative for the soil. It doesn't require a lot of pesticides. It's a kind of fantastic plant. Um, doesn't require a lot of water uh, as well. Um, it should be noted that industrial hemp that's used for architectural purposes is, is different than the hemp that's grown for its, uh, its uh, hallucinogenic capacity. Um, so industrial hemp does not have the THC, um, but its affiliation with that, is, which is why uh, it was effectively uh, kind of disappeared in the 20th century due to the war on drugs. So hemp is now kind of returned based on being included in, the, uh, in a recent farm bill from about four years ago now, I think five years ago now. So it is possible to actually grow industrial hemp uh, without the concerns uh, of, uh, 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 of being um, uh, illegal. Um, to put it another way, so um, it sh it, there's a, another long history, and um, the Parsons Healthy Materials Lab has done, and other places have done fantastic studies of the history of hemp. Um, but it, it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing plant. Its uh, skin can be separated for, from its internal herd. The herd is often used for uh, the insulation and ground up. You do need fairly expensive decorticators to do this process, but the, the, the fibrous skin can be used to make fabrics. Uh, it can actually be used to make insulation, bad insulation in particular. Um, but typically, the herd of hemp is ground up the internal part, which is quite porous and has air cavities, it's combined with uh, lime to produce what is often called uh, uh, hempcrete, which is actually not the best term because it suggests that it's a replacement for concrete, which it's not. Um, but you have hemp lime as a, as, a, uh, as a material that can be blown in on site uh, to play the role of insulation. But it can also be used to form in between walls um, or precast into blocks uh, and sold as a kind of, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a unit. Um, again, hemp is, is it, it, it's a kind of fantastic material. If you work with it, it smells a little bit like barley. Um, so if you go into a place that's working with hemp, it has a really great smell, um, which is one of the nice things about a lot of the materials I'm talking about, where you actually want to work in a plant where these materials are being processed. Um, cork is amazing. A uh, short version of cork is that it's a truly multi-dimensional material. It can, um, it, it's, it can be structural, believe it or not. It certainly is insulative. It um, absorbs humidity. It has a fantastic smell. It's mold resistant, et cetera. Uh, the downside to cork is that there's not enough of it. And um, as a result, it's actually fairly expensive. Um, cork trees are harvested every nine to 14 years. It's basically a matter of taking off the bark of the cork tree. So the tree remains and it regrows its bark. So it's in a sense uh, regenerative at some level. Um, but it also, it only grows on trees in certain climates. And most of the cork uh, is from Portugal and Spain, the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and most of it is a product of actually the waste product of the wine stopper industry. So um, most cork that gets used in architectural purposes is residue from another industry. And there's just not enough of it, right? But there, is a, there are some examples of really fantastic houses that have been made with cork. This particular house was uh, produced by CNC milling about 1,268 individual blocks of cork, um, effectively producing almost the entirety of the architecture, right? So from the structure, and these things were keystoned into each other. They corbel to produce the roof. There's a little bit of a ring beam tying them together, but it's essentially a single material um, 
doing a, a huge amount. And again, the downside with Quark is simply um, lack, of, uh, lack of quantity and the ability to scale it, if you will. On the other hand, straw is everywhere. Straw is ubiquitous. It is cheap. It's an agricultural waste product. It's basically left to rot or is, um, uh, or one way or another returns to the atmosphere. So the question with straw is how do we find a way that we can actually use it and, and, and in a sense sequester its carbon into buildings. Um, it, as I said, it's ubiquitous, it's, um, it's cheap, it's available, um, it's a carbon sink. Um, there's a rough math that the amount of uh, straw, the carbon in, in straw around the world uh, is equal to the amount of carbon that's uh, the carbon emissions of concrete or the entire carbon emissions of the country of India. So it's a huge quantity of, of carbon available. The question is how do we turn it into a better uh, building material? Um, the traditional way that um, straw is, is converted into a building is largely through working with straw bales um, that are, again, a kind of product of, uh, of, uh, of removing the straw from the wheat, barley, or, or rice fields. Um, and then those, those bales are then uh, coated in a kind of a plaster, a lime plaster or a clay-based plaster to provide some of the fire resistance as well as the weather resistance and uh, keeping uh, insects uh, and, and animals out of the wall. Um, these uh, either occur by simply stacking up the blocks, um, or you can pl place the blocks around uh, wood studs or place them into prefabricated cassettes. Um, thatch is slightly different, um, uh, using a reed material um, through its own thickness to shed water. Um, but the interesting thing about straw is to try to find a way that you could both use it for its insulative capacity and maybe even use it for its structural capacity. Because if you can compress straw sufficiently, it can actually carry load. And the, uh, this particular house, um, experimental house by Atelier um, Schmidt, um, stacked up these jumbo uh, straw bales. These are measuring roughly 30 inches by 50 inches by 100 inches. Each of them was about 650 pounds. Um, and so the compressive force internal to the straw bale and then the stacking of them really led to a self-stabilizing uh, uh, self building. Uh, the corbel roof that essentially makes the walls become part of uh, the full enclosure at the roof level with a skylight at the top. Um, and as a result of the, the kind of super thick walls, you get not only great insulation, but you also, in this particular case, store about 75 metric tons uh, of agricultural waste, which um, equates to about 84,000 uh, kilograms of CO2. Um, so it's a super interesting idea that somehow this thickness is actually beneficial architecturally, but also uh, in terms of how we might sequester carbon. Um, but we were particularly taken with this idea that thickness now isn't a problem. In fact, we, we've kind of been beat up um, with the idea that thinness and lightness is always going to be better. It's a kind of legacy of modernism. And so with, the, uh, with two of the houses we designed working with straw, the idea was more what happens if we embrace thickness? What happens if actually super thick walls are actually a benefit? They would sequester more carbon, and they start to produce different models of how you could uh, imagine uh, space and form existing uh, in conjunction. So rather than simply thinking about the wall as the thinnest enclosure around space, what happens if you start to have a much more dynamic relationship between the space and the materials, the, the thickness, if you will. It's a different way of thinking about poche, um, where the poche is actually much more instrumental in the project. So with this house, we thought about kind of combining a kind of donut of straw with a series of voids that would be carved um, and then filled with these prefabricated uh, CLT volumes, these four-sided volumes or rooms. So in a sense, you would stack up this perimeter of these large-scale rectangular jumbo blocks and then place within them these prefabricated CLT volumes that essentially would nest and the two systems would start to stabilize each other. Um, we would have a central skylight that would bring light through the middle of the donut and in a sense get a kind of spiral of rooms that would work their way up through the project. Um, we very much like the idea that the room, the window, 
the thickness was all one and the same, so that you would get this sense that a room and a void and a kind of space and the CLT, they were all part of the same thing, and they would be linked together to produce this, uh, this three-dimensional uh, space um, that was quite porous and also quite thick at the same time. So the second mass, uh, straw house uh, is called Mass Straw. And here we were trying to develop two different models of, uh, of, uh, of ways to work with, with uh, these jumbo bales. On the one hand, setting up a kind of linear wall uh, that would kind of march down the slope of the, the site. And then adjacent to it would be this kind of thickness uh, or this kind of platform uh, of straw that we would then kind of carve spaces out of it. These two would be stitched together with a series of box beams that would be infilled with straw. And then additional straw on top of the roof membrane would be, uh, in a sense, almost kind of left to rot. One of the first questions we get is typically, won't these materials deteriorate? Won't they get eaten by animals? And at some level, it's like, if you protect straw, it won't. But why not? Why not let the top of the building actually be edible by goats? Uh, not that straw is necessarily edible, but what grows out of it would be. Um, so we like the idea that somehow this project would embrace the fact that it would merge with the landscape um, and, in fact, be inhabitable by, by animals in different ways. On the other hand, on the inside, the humans would be able to kind of carve out spaces. Here you get the bedrooms and the bathrooms, the more private spaces that would be linked to a kind of collective kind of landscape um, uh, for kind of sitting, gathering, et cetera, within this thickness. And we like very much the idea that this house has as much mass as it does space, right? Um, so you get this kind of interesting correspondence between the space that's available and the thickness um, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the, the volume of the house um, that's holding all of this straw. Um, so the last thing I want to present is some uh, recent, very recent research that's in process. Um, and this is continuing this kind of interest in what, what are the architectural possibilities uh, of, of these uh, very large straw bales. Um, so we started thinking about, you know, if you take these jumbo straw bales and they're roughly about $60 a bale, you can actually make a 5,600 square foot space um, where the cost per um, square foot uh, uh, just with this material alone is $1.75. So the ability to look at inexpensive construction, but more importantly, the idea that you could start to have very different models of how you produce the space that exists within it. It doesn't have to just be an exterior wall. It can be different inhabitable spaces, different relationships between what constitutes the wall, what constitutes the interior, different relationships between what we might think of as a column versus a wall, really a you know, fundamentally different way of thinking about the kind of spatial configuration uh, of the form because you're working with a material that's fundamentally different than what we're used to, to working with. Um, and it's able to sequester carbon and be inexpensive. So here, if you introduce just the possibility of CLT uh, mass timber slabs, what are the possibilities of the spaces that could, could come about as a result? Just an early kind of quick study about what this might be. Um, in terms of tectonics, if this is load bearing and insulation and also the thickness, one could look at simple ways to surface it with membranes and interior and exterior finishes. And this led us to think about, could we take an existing building that we had worked on? Um, this was a, a, um, a child care center uh, in Arkansas uh, for about 200 young, young children that we built. Um, this was uh, done in about 2017 uh, with a series of play spaces that are specifically configured to the age groups that surround them. So there's direct connection between the interior and the exterior. The entire project was done with healthy building materials. There was no plastics used in, in the entire project. We had no latex paint. It's all mineral-based paint. Um, but the materials we used were conventional. We used drywall. We used steel. We used um, uh, concrete. And our interest was, um, could we rethink this project using, using different forms of, uh, of straw? Um, so this was looking at the model, if we did a jumbo straw bale, and could we combine a kind of wood uh, reciprocal structure to produce a series of figural rooms for the classrooms with a skylight above. Um, and we very much like the idea that these jumbo bales were thick enough that you could actually carve places for uh, children to play inside the thickness of the wall. 
but then also these could extend out to the landscape, and as they work their way into the landscape, could be left um, to be part of the, part of the grounds. Um, the project really is trying to find a way that you could take the exact same program and simply rethink it and reimagine it through the kind of uh, role of the straw bale as a catalyst. The other thing we said is, all right, if this is a version with round straw bale, what happens if we use linear straw bale? Would we end up with the same project? Um, and um, so this was the linear straw bale version where it made more sense to be efficient, uh, have a central corridor, and simply have these, uh, these uh, these classrooms that would feed to play spaces, uh, feed to exterior playgrounds um, as part of, uh, part of the, the kind of organizational premise of the project. The other thing that, that um, we found ourselves doing, which I think if you told me I was gonna be doing this five years ago, I'd probably laugh at you, but we started experimenting with how we might actually make a better straw material. Um, and in a sense, can we produce that holy grail of load-bearing insulation, right? Can we make straw be load-bearing and be, uh, perform as a form of insulation? Most um, of the, uh, the straw-based um, wall systems that uh, are on the market that are not working with straw bales, but actually integrating straw into a kind of a prefabricated system tend to work with a, with a wood frame. Um, uh, whether it's eco cocon or uh, or alpha wall, these are basically a double stud system where the straw is insulation. It's it's densely compact. Um, when you densely compact straw, it doesn't burn; it chars. Um, and another company out of Maine, Croft, is uh, at a smaller scale, is making these fantastic uh, constructions. Um, again, trying to find a way to compress straw within the thickness of the of the wood, but the wood is carrying the role of the structure. So the question is, could we make the straw be uh, be structural. So this is the kind of series of experiments we went through. We were looking at different binders. How do we hold the straw together? Um, can we mix it with earth or with soys uh, or with lime? Um, we we uh, built a compression machine with about 24,000 pounds of force. So we could actually get the straw with this binder to be compacted at a dense enough level that it could then be that load-bearing capacity. Um, and uh, you know, the difficulty here is that you have this relatively wet uh, material and you're compressing it into a, a, a kind of mold to test it. So we had to dry these molds. This is the unboxing. Um, and after that, we needed to actually test it in terms of structural and insulation, our values. So it, um, we also, did, I spent some time with a chainsaw. So we figured out different ways to kind of make, um, this was a, an attempt to make a, a, a structural system where the plywood on the outside is stitched together. Uh, we ended up having to cut some of these tests up to be able to place them into the structural Instron compression machine. You'll see here it compresses a lot. This is sped up over time and it bounces back. It takes on load non-linearly. It's slightly in, uh, inconclusive at the moment. This is our uh, thermal testing machine where we set up a kind of heat system on the inside to uh, measure the flow of heat through the system. And we're getting really good R values. Um, so uh, just to go through this a little bit more slowly, um, we, you know, to be able to kind of get the compression we need, we had to find a way to kind of uh, assemble uh, and compress straw together. And the issue here is to not make blocks, but to make a full wall system that would be able to um, then hold that load. Um, the binders were, were super kind of difficult. Mycelium, which is growing mushrooms in and around straw, was a disaster. Um, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm for mycelium, but the problem here is the mycelium didn't actually penetrate into the straw because there's no oxygen on the inside or limited oxygen, so it would only grow to the first one or two inches. Uh, there's horrible, it was, it was nasty. Mycelium didn't, didn't work, um, but, uh, but frankly, lime worked quite well. Um, and we had some uh, success with just developing a kind of uh, a SIP system, which was really just trying to figure out a way that we could develop uh, two skins that would be stitched together, and then that would uh, be able to hold the compression. So able to get 163 kilograms of straw within uh, a cubic meter, which is quite dense um, for, for the straw. A lot of the straw products are in the, say, 120 um, 20, uh, kilograms. Um, but again, the, 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 and I'm, uh, I know this is being recorded, so this is in process. We're you know, a little reluctant to show some of this because um, it's still being worked on. Um, 
but the difficulty is trying to figure out how um, we can get it compressed sufficiently that it can carry the load, uh, recognizing that it's going to continue to deflect. And our easy bake oven model with the uh, with a light on the inside and testing the thermal migration, this has been incredibly. Um, uh, it, almost too good, right? So if you look at the R values we're getting on this thing, and these are setups that have been let to, you know, let run for about two, three days, um, they start to hit a steady state and it giving us an R value of say 5.6 per inch, that's really good, that's too good, right? So we're working through why we're getting such good numbers. I think it has to do with the, the relationship between the straw and the way in which the sensor is pressed up against the straw, even though it's embedded in the machine. Anyways, all this to say that I think one of the interesting things here is to take design and not just see it in terms of form and shape making, but also expand it into the realm uh, of the material itself. And so in a sense, the exhibition is trying to get at some of those aspects. Um, the work in progress uh, that I just showed you at the end is not part of the exhibition, but the exhibition really focuses on taking the book and unfolding the book into the space of the gallery. So you see the individual projects uh, on each of the stand working their way around the space. Then contained on the inside of the, uh, of the series of stands uh, are a sequence of materials that go from most carbon sequestering to most carbon emitting uh, around the space. And the data about that uh, is, is identified here. Again, it's an approximate data. Um, and then on the other side of the gallery are the seven, uh, seven projects. Um, I want to thank Alexandra. Um, I also have to thank Kyle Reich, who's here in the front row, um, who not only kind of led the installation, but also was instrumental in the book and the design work, along with Celia Chesabel um, and Ryan and Olivia for helping put together the exhibition. It wouldn't have happened without, with, without all of you. But we're incredibly kind of optimistic about what we think is a fundamentally different way of thinking about architecture, um, where materials have agency that push us in fundamentally different directions um, that actually have benefits that um, both kind of transform what we might do, but also um, change our relationship uh, to the kind of global uh, questions of climate um, and the global questions of ecology. So thank you very much.